Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil E. Colonna, and this is Nashville. The next time you get stuck in traffic while traveling across town, I want you to pause for a moment. Try to imagine Nashville without all of the cars. Yes, not a single car on the road. Well, obviously, there was a reality like this before we had cars. Back then, Nashville relied on street railways. Streetcars wove throughout the city on simple dirt roads with rail tracks. On Woodland Street, from 10th to 16th, from Woodland to Gallatin and beyond. What was our city like before cars? My next guests are here to take us back in time. Ralkin Wagner is a historian and author of Nashville Streetcars and Interurban Railway. Ralkin, welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you. And glad to be here. Glad to have you. And David Still Ewing is a historian and tour guide who runs the Instagram account, The Nashville I Wish I Knew. David, welcome back to the show. It's great to be back. Great to have you with us. So, Ralkin, let's let's start with you. Take us back to the late 1800s. How were folks getting around town back then? Well, to go back uh, a little bit earlier than that, 1870s, they uh, up until that point, from the, the time that Nashville was incorporated till about that time, the only way of getting around was either, either on horseback or on foot. The city of Nashville at that time was small enough that everyone could pretty much walk every place. But by the time we got into the 1870s, uh, more and more people started moving toward the edge of town where land was more affordable. So uh, they had to have a means of uh, getting to and from the center of the city. So uh, they started uh, coming up with what were called uh, horse, well, mule-drawn and horse-drawn cars. Mm. And they were simply a car that did run on steel rails because uh, railroads had been around for 30 or 40 years. So they were kind of based on that. And I think that a similar gauge. And uh, the uh, they basically two or three lines started running and they were all pulled, some were pulled by mules and others horses, depending on how long they were. So like and, a certain amount of efficiency, I imagine. Yes, Okay, so the, so the so-called streetcar era, and it kicked off around the 1890s. What did it look like here in Nashville? Okay, well, they all the lines uh, were completely electrified by 1889, and so everything was run on electricity, overhead trolley wires mostly, and they all connected at the center of town uh, at a, a facility called a transfer station, which, which was just uh, right off uh, the public square. Now, can you kind of set the scene for us? What did these streetcars look like? Um, They were on cars that were on steel rails. Uh, Some had a single set set of wheels called a truck, and some were double truck uh, cars. Inside, they were very, uh, very simple. They had rattan seats, which was a type of cane. Um, They were, of course— for the entire history of the streetcar uh, period, they were all, it was, was during the Jim Crow era, so everything was segregated. Mm-hmm. And um, people would normally board the streetcar at the back of the car where the conductor would collect the fare, which was normally about five cents for much of the history. And then they would leave toward the front. So they were two-man crews. You had the conductor and the motorman who was responsible for stopping, starting, and, and opening the doors. Now, I understand that not all of the roadways in Nashville were made for free use. Is that right? Uh, I'm confused. I'm sorry. Well, some of the roads, I understand, were toll roads? Well, I'm not sure they were by that time. I know toll roads existed in a lot of the 19th century, but I guess maybe at the turn of the century, some of them were. I heard like Nolensville Pike and Gallatin Pike were roads that people had to pay to get on. Correct. Okay, so David, your family has been here for nine generations. They were around for the beginning of this era. What was life like for them back at this time? 
My great-great-grandfather lived in Hermitage, so he took a train into the city where he was a lawyer downtown. But his twin brother actually lived in the city, kind of in the Germantown area, and then later by the Capitol. And the African-American community back then was located near Capitol Hill. The business district was kind of in the area where Municipal Auditorium is on 4th Avenue and Martin Luther King. And everyone still had to kind of travel to come downtown. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Jim Crow uh, streetcars. Our streetcars were fully integrated until 1905 when the Tennessee state legislature passed a Jim Crow bill statewide. Really, it came from Memphis. Memphis wanted to kind of separate blacks and whites. And actually in Nashville and in Chattanooga and Knoxville, the companies that owned these did not really care about segregation, but the Memphis got their way and that's when everything started to kind of change. I want to get into that in the <clears throat> next part of our show, but what industries were really growing in Nashville at that time? We, the manufacturing industries. On Charlotte Avenue, we made Duckhead Jeans. In the Wedgwood, Houston area, the May Hosiery Mill was there. Worthen Bag was in Germantown. And so you had these large manufacturing companies that hired hundreds of people, and oftentimes those people traveled by streetcar. So I can imagine it was just, these streetcars were rather packed full of people all the time. They were. Um, really, around 1910, probably 85% of Nashvillians took streetcars. Wow. Know, not many people had cars. They were very expensive. And the streetcar lines basically went wherever you wanted and was ran very frequently. How did that impact transportation in the city? Like, what did it do to help the city expand? Well, the old days of the city limits of Nashville, kind of around before World War I, Nashville was the downtown interstate loop. There was a little bit of Germantown and East Nashville in the city. For those people who graduated from Vanderbilt, the first line of the Vanderbilt alma mater is on the city's western border. So in 1873, when Vanderbilt was established, it was in the county, but not the city. Mm. And when these these streetcar companies were often worked hand in hand with private real estate developers. For example, Guilford Dudley Sr. Um, bought a lot of land in the Richland Central area, and then he was a, related to a streetcar company. So if you wanted to buy land kind of out past the city limits, if you couldn't get there, it wasn't very valuable. So when the streetcars came out there, it opened up whole new neighborhoods and parts of town. Now, who were, I wonder, who were the people using streetcars? As you mentioned, these factory workers and obviously, uh, you know, blue collar workers were mm -hmm. using it. But did people of a different class use the streetcars as well? Everybody used streetcars, the mm -hmm. bankers and the doctors and the lawyers. It was just transportation. You know, we kind of left, as Ralkon said, the kind of horse and buggy era and kind of went to automobiles. But kind of in between that, around World War I and in the 20s, before most people had their own commercial automobile, streetcars were really your mode of transportation. Matt, you all mentioned the segregation that was taking place at the time and the difference for black and brown travelers. What were, were, there, were the conditions on the streetcars any different, Ralkon? You mean uh, between different communities? Yeah. Well, uh, other than segregation, uh, well, of course, what what's interesting, of course, with the streetcar company, um, the people operating the streetcars, all the uh, employees were white males. As far as I know, uh, that's all they had working, uh, in, except maybe doing, uh, you know, work doing maintenance of way work on the tracks. But getting back to what you were originally saying, um, I guess there was some problems with um, around 19... 1905 was that why the the and well, David well, should address that more yeah. but I guess there was some problems where they that another company was set up to better serve we're definitely going to get into that yes. in the next segment you know mm -hmm. but, but other than that I don't I don't think so I think everything was just it was Jim Crow and things were divided and I don't think there were there were yeah. any major problems you know I think it's hard for us to imagine how what the tensions on public transportation were back then. Like, very few people had tri private transportation, as you mentioned, David. So everyone was using these streetcars. Every race from upper-class lawyers to middle-class merchants to working-class folks, people with their prejudices had existed long before the Civil War that were packed into these streetcars. How did all that play out? 
And when you say packed, that they were really kind of cheek and jowl in these streetcars because you just kind of cram as many people. Sometimes you'd have a seat. Sometimes you'd be particularly around what we call rush hour. Um, you know, but the improvement of transportation was much better. The horse and buggy days, we had these dirt roads before paved. The city of Nashville had what was called a sprinkler department where they sprinkled down the roads because these horse and buggies would kick up dust and your suit would get dirty and it would be in your mouth. And so if you wet the roads, you know, when the wheels went over this um, dirt road before we had pavers, that was you know, just part of the day's travel. All right. We have to take a short break. We'll get back to our conversation about the history of Nashville in rail in just a few. So everybody stay with us. This is Nashville. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for PrEP and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Back in the day, Nashville relied on streetcars, a reality that's hard for us to imagine now, given that we've become a city that relies so heavily on cars for transportation. This hour, we're looking back at that history and how Nashville, the Nashville we know today, how it grew out of that. Of course, the streetcar era intersected with the Jim Crow era, through which southern cities and states legalized racial segregation. So how did that affect the access to transit for black Nashvillians at the time. I'd like to bring in my next guest to help answer that question. Linda Wynn is Assistant Director for State Programs for the Tennessee Historical Commission and a former history professor at Fisk University. Professor Wynn, thank you for being here and welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure to have you. So, you know, what did black Nashville look like at that time? Well, at that time... You know, when you're looking at post-Reconstruction, post-P.V. Uh, Ferguson, up to the streetcar boycotts, uh, Nashville was a, a mix, you know, with in terms of the African-American community. Um, the General Assembly, you know, looked at segregating people starting in 1899 on transportation. And if you think about 1899 and you think about Plessy versus Ferguson, that's one year after that case. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it didn't pass. It ultimately goes to about 1905. It passes. I think it's in March. And African Americans respond uh, with that act of resistance. You know, we tend to think, I, I think at some times, that when we look back at African Americans, say, at the beginning of the 20th century, or the end of the 19th century, that there was, we didn't resist, but we did. History is replete mm. with African-American resistance. Uh, I often think about, when I, when I think about transportation, I think about black women uh, in terms of their acts of resistance. You can go back to Sojourner Truth. Uh, in the 1860s, you can look at Elizabeth Jennings, for example, uh, 1855, Ida B. Wells, Memphis, 1892, uh, right here in Nashville with the streetcar boycott. You had a Mrs. Uh, Phillips, W.B. Phillips, uh, who protested. If you come down to the more modern era, you can look at 1944 with, uh, uh, oh, her name is Irene Irene Morgan, mm -hmm. uh, the Morgan versus Virginia case, or Sarah Keys in 1952, and you can move up to Rosa Parks in 1955. So women, black women, have this long history of resisting uh, segregation on public transportation, be it streetcars or, you know, whatever. And I always think about 
women because we tend to be left out of the story. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand that. Now, you know, you mentioned the case Plessy versus Ferguson, a very famous, infamous Supreme Court case. Can you give us a brief breakdown of what it was and how that really impacted Nashville at the time? Well, uh, separate but unequal, as I put it. Mm -hmm. uh, the case is really separate but equal. But it was separate. How can you be separate and equal? How can you provide a separate car? Uh, let's look at Ida B. Wells, who paid for a first-class ticket. Or let's look at Mrs. Phillips. You know, how can you have separate and it be equal? Ida B. Wells bought a first-class ticket, was put in the smoker car. So when she gets to the place that she's going, she's filled with what? Soot. Mm -hmm. Is that equal? I would say no. I would say no, too. So, you know, the whole premise of P.V. Ferguson is that you can be separate and equal. And, of course, that's what Brown v. Board overturned, the separate and unequal aspect of uh, racial segregation. So, you know, that separate but equal or unequal doctrine was adopted nationally. What about on the streetcars here at Nashville? Uh, it was adopted in, in 1905, uh, and black Nashvillians resisted. Uh, when you read uh, the Nashville Clarion or the Nashville Globe, which were black newspapers, they talk about how no intelligent black person is going to ride a segregated streetcar. And what it really does is provide an impetus for black Nashvillians to uh, incorporate a streetcar company mm -hmm. and to have their own streetcars. Now, they are ultimately sabotaged by the city of Nashville uh, when they have to go to electric cars. But, you know, if you, if you stop and think about the people who were involved, like J.C. Napier, Napier was a good friend of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington basically had this idea of self-help, self-promotion. And so it, it's very easy to see how uh, Napier or Boyd or Preston Taylor would come up with this idea of a separate streetcar company. Uh, you know, they told African Americans, you know, buy some good shoes, Don... Put on some good socks. Trim your coins. Don't get on the don't get on those streetcars. Mm. And you know, for I think the streetcar ended about 1907. Uh, and for a good while, African Americans stayed off. But if you look at the terrain of Nashville, it's very hilly, right? Mm -hmm. And when they switched over to the electric cars. Uh, and they had to be charged, and they would take them to the electric company to charge them, the electric company sabotage. Mm. And, you know, we all look out for self-interest. You know, you have to go to work. You have to pay bills. You have to do... Got to feed yourself. Got to feed yourself. And so they started going back to the regular streetcars because the other streetcars were not being able to keep up with the schedule. Mm -hmm. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Colonna. We're talking this hour about the streetcar system that served as Nashville's first form of public transportation. My guests are li historian Linda Wynn. Now, historian and ninth-generation Nashvillean David Steele Ewing is still with us. Now, David, we're talking about this protest and boycott of African Americans on the streetcars from 1905 to 1907. But I understand that a group of black men took matters into their own hands, including one of your ancestors. Yes. My great-great-grandfather was the first black lawyer in Nashville, and his twin brother was also a lawyer. His name was Taylor Ewing Sr. And Taylor was the lawyer of the Boyds who started the publishing company. And so as Linda said in 1905, after the state legislature passes this Jim Crow law to segregate, they basically took away a right, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why I think the African Americans were really upset about this. They had been used to sitting anywhere, and then that changed. 
And so the same people like Preston Taylor and J.C. Napier and Dr. Boyd, who later started the One Cent Savings Bank, now Citizens, the oldest continuously operated bank in the United, black-owned bank in the United States, they not only started this company, they invested in it. They invested their money to buy equipment, to hire employees. And this was one of Nashville's greatest stories, even though it was not long-term successful because of the sabotage of the white streetcar company. Talk to me a little bit about that sabotage. What did they do? So they bought the equipment. Uh, They first had steam streetcars that could not make it up Martin Luther King. Kind of think about where the North Gulch is or Capitol View, which was a black neighborhood back then, and going up the hill toward the state capitol, kind of toward where Municipal Auditorium is, the black business district. So steam cars didn't work, and so they got electric uh, streetcars. But they did not have a battery charger. Mm -hmm. That was a very expensive piece of equipment. And the people that had the battery charger was the white owned streetcar company and power company. And so they did not want this upstart competitor to succeed. So when they bought their batteries to be charged with their machines, they overcharged them on purpose to damage them and destroy them. Mm. And this was the Nashville Railway and Light Company, correct? Yes. Yes. So they're this big player in town at the time. They're the electric company and the streetcar company combined. Wow, that's a a pretty robust monopoly they've got on. You know, so how did they use their influence to really affect the entire transportation network, not just this one specific company that these African-Americans started? Well, in the early days of the streetcar lines, you know, somebody just owned a little individual, you know, down Murfreesboro Road or down Hillsboro Road or down West End. They were these little mom and pop businesses. They weren't consolidated. But the and the African-Americans basically had a route in the African-American business district. But later, Nashville Railway and Light became the kind of larger entity that kind of ran all the streetcars in Nashville. And then we had the bus era. So they were powerful, and they used their influence to basically defeat the competition. But the African-Americans that started this union transportation company, they were the same people that would, you know, basically speak up against discrimination, that would start schools, that would start movements, that would start businesses, We probably had more African-American-owned businesses back during this time than we do today. Mm. Now, in in 1918, I understand that there was a massive train wreck, one of the worst in our Mm -hmm. country's history, at the Dutchman's Curve. What caused the wreck? What caused the wreck was Plessy versus Ferguson and engineer era. So Linda mentions uh, separate but equal for Plessy versus Ferguson. We had 101 people die in this train wreck which is still to this day the worst train crash in American history. More people have never died on a train than behind the Bellmead Publix when two trains hit at 60 miles an hour in a horseshoe bend. But the trains were segregated because of Plessy. So you had African-American cars and white cars. And why it was damning is location, location, location about you know a train car. The best place to be on a train car is at the very end, and that's where the white cars were, and they were made of steel, and they were Pullman cars. Mm. The African-American cars were Civil War era cars made of wood right behind the steam engine. And so when these two trains collided, those cars telescoped, splintered, and caught on fire. Most of the people that died in that accident were in these wooden cars. There was a smoking car that was also had white people, so the white people that died at Dutchman's Curve were in the smoking car, None of the people that were in the steel Pullman car because of Plessy were even hurt. Wow. You know, Linda, how can we look at this point in our history and apply those lessons to what we're facing now? That's that's a a good question. Uh, You know, when I was teaching and talking about the 1905 streetcar boycott here in Nashville, and I think we should mention it happened in about 23, 27 other cities. It was not just Nashville. It was something that was regional hmm. uh, in the, the South based on those laws. You know, I think 1905 was a... I think it helped with 1955. It's hmm. about 50 years later. Mm-hmm. Some of the same techniques are used. Uh, when we look at today, you know, 
when I was teaching, young people used to say, well, you know, this is not your civil rights movement or the civil rights movement of your parents. Um, and I say, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's different, but you are applying the same principles. Hmm. You are in it for the same reasons. It may not be out and out racial discrimination, but there is still some aspect of discrimination or you wouldn't be protesting whatever it is you may be protesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think it's important that we know and understand history. And one of my concerns in this present time with the cancellation and book banning uh, I used to tell my students, your, your your brain can't process what your eyes can't see. Mm -hmm. And if you can't at least read about what took place, you don't know how to relate to it. Now, I don't think that's so much for us as it is for, for others, mm -hmm. uh, based on the premise that I don't want my child to be hurt or, or whatever the case may be. Uh if it's not in the books, and you'd be surprised at how many students will tell you, I never knew anything about that, and it could be something that I thought almost every, you know, every student would know. But it's not in the books. If it's not in the books, then I don't know. And if I don't know, then my perception is it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's part of the reason that we are having book banning is not a problem. Yes, ma'am. Linda Wynn is a historian and a former history professor at Fisk University. Professor Wynn, thank you again for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll look at how Nashville transitioned from streetcars to buses and motor vehicles and how that trans transformation is still underway today. Do you think we should have a light rail service in the city? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil e. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We've been talking this hour about our city's first major public transportation system, streetcar railways. We heard about how they were started and learned how black Nashvillians were excluded. So how did this history shape the Nashville we know today? For that, I'd like to introduce my next guest. Debbie Ezer Cox is a historian and retired Metro Nashville archivist assistant. Debbie, thanks for being with us today. Welcome to This Thank is Nashville. You. I'm glad you're to be here. I'm Thanks for having me. So happy to have you. Historians David Steele Ewing and Ralkin Wagner are still with us. So, Debbie, I understand you're a ninth generation Davidson County resident, just like David Steele Ewing. Is that right? That's that's correct. That's a long time to have a lot of family here. Yeah, it is. I, I'm truly a, a Nashvillian. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, you know, your parents used streetcars for transportation. What did they tell you about their experience? Um. Well, of course, it was just normal to them. Uh, my mother, even after the buses came along, always would say, "We got to get our car fare out hmm. to get to get on the bus." Um, it was it was the way my daddy did own a car when they got married, and it's the way they went to work or went shopping. Everything was downtown or beyond, and so uh, they. Uh, they rode them on probably almost on a daily basis. They rode the street. Did they seem to enjoy it or was it just, hey, this is how we get around town, our means of transportation? I think it was just an ordinary thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> although sometimes, uh, you know, they it, it they would have they would go to see people that they couldn't see otherwise. And so they really enjoyed the, the uh, ease mm -hmm. of getting places now. I wonder how, like, the use of streetcars helped out families that were not wealthy. Uh, well, they weren't very expensive. Uh, a nickel car fare, Mama used to say. And so, uh, you know, and sometimes she couldn't come up with a nickel, so she'd walk to town. Okay. But uh, uh, it, was, it was just poor people 
were just stuck in their neighborhood without some sort of transportation or they had to walk long distances. Mm -hmm. And so when the streetcars came along, that gave them uh, new areas, new communities. Uh, And Mama worked downtown. My daddy worked out by the state prison and he could ride the streetcar from our house in East Nashville all the way to the state prison. He had to switch cars, but... It went all the way there. Do you have an idea of how long a trip that was for him? I don't. I don't think I ever heard him say, but I don't think it was a, any worse than riding buses. Okay. Yeah. Now, you know, in preparing for the show, we came across this term, streetcar neighborhoods. Yes. Can you tell us what those are? Well, it was neighborhoods that developed because the streetcar lines allowed people to live there. Uh, I've done a lot of research on the Inglewood community, which is where I live. And uh, the ads for selling the lots in the new development would say streetcar just at the top in big, bold letters Hmm. so that you knew it would be easy to get there and get back to town to go to work and or for the women to go shopping. And um, and that was all that was the streetcars went to Inglewood. They went to Waverly. They went to uh, uh out Jefferson Street, they went into East Nashville pretty deep. They went to the parks. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it it just, these neighborhoods would not have developed without that transportation. Oh, yeah. It was the, the main attraction it, yeah, to get there. Yeah, it was there. T- a little too far to walk to town from there. Yes, ma'am. Now, you know, I'm pretty curious about how the Great Depression really affected transportation companies in the city. Ralkin, what happened to the prominent companies in the city at that time? Well, up until uh, 1973, all the companies throughout history were uh, privately owned and they were a for-profit. Started out with about a dozen companies originally, and by 1902 or 03, they all consolidated into the Nashville Railway and Light Company. It was called that because they also furnished electricity for the city of Nashville which was later taken over by NES and TVA. But getting back to what you were saying, um, they they pretty much all struggled. They were struggling companies, and that's why they uh, Nashville Railway and Light was taken over by the Tennessee Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, uh, and they all pretty much were losing money. There was one big controversy that happened in Nashville when they decided that they wanted to raise the fare from five to seven cents. And I think the, the city or the state forced them to drop it back down to five cents. But uh, they, anyone's pretty much, as I understood it, they ran it at a, at a loss. And it was that way even into the bus era. Um, maybe I'm getting ahead of where we're supposed to be. But uh, the uh, in uh, 1973, uh, which was nearly 50 years ago, the Metropolitan Transit Authority was created so it could be a fully uh, public or subsidized company. And because the private uh, outfits like Nashville Transit uh, Company just couldn't make a go of it. They couldn't get new equipment or anything. You know, I wanted to ask you, like, how did the influx of cars and buses affect congestion and space within the city as they made this transition? Well, I know they cut into ridership quite a bit uh, as soon as, like, 1930s and 40s. Um there were quite a few, several accidents between cars and streetcars. I mean, it was just a mm. um, continuing risk they had. Drivers not paying attention, cutting too close to the streetcars. So there were accidents. So the influx of cars came pretty much after World War II, you'd say? It started in the 30s, but especially after, well, then you had rationing during the war. But then when the war was over, there was a great influx in cars and traffic. You know, I'm I'm wondering, these street, streetcar companies are kind of suffering financially. As you said, they're operating at a loss. They're, they're being phased out. David, what did they do? What kind of schemes did they come up with to try to continue to make money and stay relevant? Well, the automobile era had definitely come. Um, the suburban areas were growing. It's interesting that Debbie talked about neighborhoods developing. You know, ranch houses often had garages, but back in the, the bungalow era, the Foursquare or area, You might not have had a car, but you had a nice house. But the way to kind of hold on to their power was just to offer more routes and frequent routes. But by that time, people were just 
used to not taking public transit or a certain group of people were not used to taking public transit. And then the more gas powered buses kind of took over in the late 30s, early 40s. Now, now, Debbie, cars became more popular, but not everybody had access to them, right? That's right. So what did most people use for transportation? Uh, in my family, we used the city bus. We, You could usually catch a bus within a block or two of home if you lived in inner city or in what they called the suburbs, the streetcar, the old streetcar neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... We went to town on a regular basis. That's where we went to the movies or to shop or to pay bills, uh, do our banking, whatever. And so from the time I was a really small child, uh, we rode the buses. And then as a teenager, I continued to ride the bus. I thought it was great fun to to go and catch the bus and go to town without my mother. Mm -hmm. And so I think I even remember neighbors who were uh, professional people riding the bus to and from work. So there wasn't that much of a class distinction between the folks who rode the bus back then? I don't think it was, you know, a tremendous difference. Uh, Even as I was growing up in the 50s and the 60s, a lot of people still didn't have cars, or there might be one car, but the husband took that car to work. And so if the wife wanted to go somewhere, she would use the bus as transportation. Now, David... Tell me, how did your family make that transition from streetcars to buses and personal vehicles? Right. My uh, grandfather taught at Pearl High School for many, many years, and he lived just a few blocks away on Arena Place, which is off of Charlotte. And so, but he had, you know, kids and a wife. My my grandmother worked for the African-American Tennessee School for the Blind that's kind of there on Hermitage Avenue, the building. We're debating it. But, you know, I think in the African-American community back then, we lived closer to our schools and our churches and our other kind of places. And so we did not take as much probably transportation because areas like Donaldson and Green Hills were kind of off limits Hmm. for the African-American community. So you were more likely to go to the Jefferson Street area, the downtown area and parts of East Nashville. Now, you know, I want to jump forward a few decades. Ralph, you know, Nashville is one of the cities in the region that doesn't have a major rail system. You know, there was a referendum that was voted down in 2018. But now that the city is continuing to grow, let me ask you this. Do you think that people will change their minds and embrace a light rail system? Well, we have so many people coming in from the West Coast uh, and New York places that uh, that they're used to having mass transit and um uh, so they're coming to Nashville and they're saying, hey, you know, how come you just have buses and we don't have commuter commuter rail? Well, we have the WeGo Star now, but uh, originally they were, the city was, even before that referendum a few years ago, there was, there was a plan uh, to try and have regional rail, not just going to Lebanon, but also a line going to Smyrna, Murfreesboro, and the other one to Hendersonville and... Uh, and Gallatin, but it just didn't work out because of capacity issues on the railroad, the freight railroads. Mm. Um, So do you think having a light rail system would help us out? About 20 seconds. uh, I'm not sure that because of all the hills and everything that would be compatible. I know that the the model that uh, we go transportation is going by, they prefer buses. So I'm not sure light rail would work out. And okay. in, it seems like a good idea, though. I, I can just imagine subways in Nashville. Maybe it's a dream of mine. I want to thank our guests, historians Debbie Ezer Cox, Ralkin Wagner, and David Steele Ewing. I want to thank you all here and giving us a little glimpse into Nashville's past. We want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. Tomorrow, our city has a thriving and robust food and beverage scene, not to mention tourism, hotels, and event venues. So what's that scene like for folks who work in hospitality here? Tune in. This is Nashville. It's a production of WPLN and WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Rose Gilbert, and Magnolia McKay. Our digital lead is Anna gallegos Cannon, Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tutto. Shout out to our intern, Tori Hoover, and the masterminds behind our theme music, LaRange and Namir Namir Blade. Conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. This Is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.